South Korea, 51 million people, a GDP of one and a half trillion dollars, world leaders in technology and industry, and the most connected country on the planet. And it's home to the latest company to join the INEOS family. This month, we're coming to you from the southern coast of Korea, at the home of K-Resin, a brand new acquisition by INEOS Star Illusion. We'll find out all about this great company and more in this month's In TV. Coming up, INEOS Styrolution is the world leader in Styrenix, with the acquisition of the global K resin business underlining their clear growth strategy. We're on site to hear more about the deal. In terms of our production capability, we have 5.5 million metric tons of uh, production across the globe. At INEOS, we hire the best and we provide the best opportunities. Some of our grads have just finished the most epic adventure in the corporate world. We find out who survived in NAM 17. I've never hated anything in the world more than this wind just now. This wind is terrific. And as always, we'll hear from the INEOS chairman, Jim Ratcliffe, and catch up with the latest news and insight from across the group. You know, I was very conventional in my sort of early years. I went to university to become engineering, and then I spent 15 years in industry. INEOS Star Illusion's further expansion in South Korea is one of the most exciting developments in the group this year. And to help me find out more, I'm joined by Yoon Hee, a long-time member of the K-Resin team. Thank you, Tom. 안녕하세요. Here at K-Resin, we are fast learning what it means to be part of INEOS family. And to find out more, NTB went to the Star Illusion headquarters in Germany to see what else they have planned this year. INEOS Styrolution produce materials that are the building blocks of modern life. The name of this particular field? Styrenix. We're a global Styrenix supplier. In fact, we're the only global Styrenix supplier in, in the industry today. In terms of our production capability, we have 5.5 million metric tons of uh, production across the globe. Roughly about 40% of what we produce is styrene monomer and then another 40% of what we produce is ABS and polystyrene, and then the last 20% of what we do is uh, our styrenic specialty grades. Take this little lady. She started life as styrene, a clear, colorless liquid derived from natural gas. This is the building block for INEOS Styrolutions products. Combining with other chemicals in a polymerization process gives styrene different properties, properties which are incredibly useful. From blood bags to bumpers, Styrenix benefits all of us. It's a sector where the technology and demand are constantly advancing. To keep up, Styrolution has developed a unique approach. Our growth strategy for the company is something we like to call our triple shift strategy. First, we needed to focus in on certain industries uh, that really offered the potential for growth in Styrenix. The next part of the shift is to focus in on our higher valued products. And then lastly, we were looking at where is Styrenix, where's the real growth for Styrenix occurring? And we see that as like with many products, it's in China, it's in the Far East. In order to grow, then you need to stay at the forefront of your industry. Styrolution does this by focusing on the customer and providing solutions through research and innovation. With its HQ in Frankfurt, it formed a unique partnership with the University of Bayreuth and research company NMB. We try to share ideas, we get uh, problems which are existing at the Neo Revolution and we take this as a challenge actually. We find topics and then we work on it. We really uh, fundamentally support the innovation at uh, in your star evolution. The typically R&D is perceived as being, you know, kind of working in an ivory tower. I can say for my team, especially together with Byroid, this is definitely not the case. We are very close to the customer, thanks to our great contacts with the Ineo Star Revolution business team. If there is one industry that is pushing the boundaries of possibility furthest, then that's the automotive sector. With a constant demand for lighter, stronger and new aesthetic attributes. It's here where this partnership thrives. 
Yeah, uh, some examples uh, what we actually successfully supported in our joint collaboration are for instance scratch resistant material. Here we did build up a new instrumentation to measure scratch resistance. Also we picked up development on nanoparticles to be used in a way that scratch resistance is improved. This is a very nice technology demonstrator from our collaboration. This is an interior part of a car. We combine in this demonstrator two types of material. One part is this very expensive glass fiber reinforced organo sheet with the ribs which is made by an amorphous thermoplastic material which is much more inexpensive. And this demonstrator gives us a possibility now to talk to customers in automotive industry. On the other side, for Ineos Styrolution, it's an advantage that they put their material in this demonstrator. So, together we are strong. It's a special setup that provides answers for customers, not just in Germany, but all over the world. A strong global network of R&D partners is essential for our business, because the uh, Business footprint is global. We have assets in all three regions of the world and we have developmental demand in all three regions of the world. The ideas and the new technologies that the research institutions are creating, this is really valuable to our customers, especially global customers. For instance, if we get something approved at BMW, again, then we can supply BMW factories locally around the world. So I think this is a really an asset, again, that separates us from our competition. We're really the only global styrenic supplier that has production capability for all products in every region of the world. It's this desire to have local production for a global customer base that's driven the latest acquisition here in Korea. Kerosene is a well-established brand, making some of the clearest, most durable plastics on the market. So we took a closer look at what makes Styrolution and K-Resin a perfect fit. K-Resin is Ineos Styrolution's first acquisition and highlights the dedication to the triple shift strategy. The site produces a styrene butadiene copolymer. Styrolution already manufacture this in the USA and Europe. But, in line with the focus on growth markets, K-Resin will become Styrolution's local supplier to its Asian customer base. Producing a crystal clear, flexible and strong plastic, used primarily in medical and packaging applications, it's a brand that is well known in the industry. Tom caught up with G.S. Yang, the K-Resin site manager, to get his take on the acquisition. So GS, let me start by asking you about the wider petrochemical complex here. Our k resin plant is located at the Yosu Petrochemical Complex, which is the largest industrial park in the southwest of Korea. It therefore benefits from the highly competitive infrastructure and pipeline physical access. Now we're standing in front of this magnificent model, but can you tell us a bit more about what you actually produce here? Here, the reproduced K resin, it has strong the footprint in the growing the Asian market and is used in the wide range of consumer products. So can you share with us how it's been for you joining Ineos Styrolution? It has been very good so far that we have been excited to join Ineos Styrolution, who is fully dedicated to the styronics and strongly committed to growing its specialty business. We are very happy to support the triple shift growth strategy here in Asia. South Korea had an incredible period of economic growth in the late part of the 20th century, which has enabled it to become the country that it is today. All that was built on the back of a determined and highly educated workforce. Ineos is benefiting from this, not just here in Yeosu, but also in Seoul, where we are taking advantage of Korea's solid economy. Seoul is one of uh, leading global cities. It's one of the largest cities in the world. Our office is located in the Gangnam area. Many people are familiar with Gangnam because of Gangnam style song. You know this dance. <laughs> Welcome to Korea! 
Seoul is the gateway to the Asian market for INEOS nitriles. And the business is well established with a small and dedicated team. PP has been in Korea over 30 years and INEOS Nitrous Asia team has operated uh, Acrylo Nitrous since INEOS acquired uh, Innovin chemicals in year 2005. Our main customers are LG, Lotte, which is Samsung, and Shimei, uh, Sintomer, Stylolution, and Torei, which are very big companies in the world. Ineos Nitrise ships about 300 metric ton per year into Asia market, which is approximately one third of uh, global sales. Nitrile's products are manufactured at the Ineos site in Green Lake, Texas. The product has to travel halfway around the world, and that's a challenge the team here negotiate daily. We store the product into our tanks in Ulsan, and we deliver that product to the customers into intra-Asia region. Working from the same bustling office as the Nitrile's employees is the INEOS Styrolution team. Uh, my name is Bong Yul Kim. I'm responsible for the supply chain management procurement in Korea. With three manufacturing plants at their site in Ulsan, South Korea, they procure raw materials, as well as supply some of Asia's best-known brands and companies with their products. Yeah, we have many customers, not only Korean market, but also the global market. As you can see, our materials go into many different uh, products such as refrigerator, car parts, even food package. Now we have heard all about Korea. Let's catch up with the latest news from the rest of the Ineos group. The 29th of June marked a huge milestone for Go Run For Fun. The world's largest children's running initiative celebrated its 200,000th child crossing the finish line at the event held at the Olympic Park. The event also signified the beginning of a collaboration between Go Run For Fun and the Daily Mile. This is a significant day because for the first time ever, Go Run For Fun and the Daily Mile have joined up in a wonderful celebration of children's running. Go Run For Fun and the Daily Mile are part of a shift away from competitive sport and into health and well-being for all children. Cheering on the 5,000 primary school children from London and across Britain were VIP guests from the world of sport, including legendary British Olympians Denise Lewis and Colin Jackson. One of the most important things when you're introducing initiatives to youngsters is that they see the real fun element side of it, because then it doesn't seem like a chore. The best initiatives are the simple ones, where you know both parties have a vested interest, and both Go Run For Fun and The Daily Mile do. Their sole driver is about changing the well-being and attitude to healthy lifestyle and they're doing it brilliantly with events like this. A new home for our colleagues in Cologne is under construction. With dynamic new working environments and a 200 square meter gym, this state-of-the-art office will create a fresh workspace for 450 employees. I've worked for the site now for 17 years. I'm very proud that in my career, this new office building is built. Very thankful feeling, to be honest. As an employer, I have to take care of their work-life balance. But we can offer something and we can offer opportunities to have sports very easily because it's in the new office building very close. We can offer a different kind of nutrition and then, of course, give some initiatives to people to think about their life, think about their work-life balance. The office will also have its own brand new restaurant and canteen. Head chef Frank Eggerman can't wait to get in there and rustle up some healthy and nutritious dishes. Ich freue mich riesig drauf, also einmal um das, das Projekt äh, von Anfang an, also dass ich dabei sein durfte auch bei der Gestaltung äh, von einer neuen Küche, von einem neuen Speisesaal, also ich glaube, das macht man nur einmal im Leben und äh, das hat mich persönlich schon mal ganz ganz gefreut dabei zu sein. Ja, auf jeden Fall. There's so much going on here at Ineos that it's becoming difficult to fit it all in to one news package. So this month, we've got a special report on Ineos's brand new energy station. This month sees the beginning of an exciting new movement within Ineos. Putting the H in SHE, 
August will see the launch of the INEOS Energy Station, an online fitness hub. The aim is to encourage activity and a healthy lifestyle for everyone within the company. Designed and constructed by Galazzo, a company who specialise in getting organisations moving, it's all built around one simple idea. People have to believe in the idea that uh, a healthy mind and a healthy body uh, uh, make you better uh, in life, uh, at home, but also at work. The INEOS Energy Station is, is there for everybody. Uh, whatever is your level of physical activity, uh, uh, there is something in the INEOS Energy Station that will be of interest for you. Being that INEOS is a pretty energetic place already, July saw the launch of the first global company initiative. The Tour de France challenge was a cycling challenge to get colleagues out on two wheels and it saw the first interactions with the energy station. We've been creating this Tour de France challenge where we've actually got people from, from around the different sites uh, doing various bits and pieces and linking their apps like Strava and other bits and pieces to this online platform because INEOS is a challenger company whether it's in business or actually in uh, its kind of sporting kind of ethos. And so far it seems to be working. With 41 teams across the group all getting involved, it's been a massive success. One location is Köln, Germany, where three teams there have clocked up 22,488 kilometers in their efforts. Wir nehmen an der Challenge teil, wo sich die verschiedenen Standorte untereinander ja betteln sozusagen, die meisten Kilometer zu erfahren und äh, weil man kann was machen, was aktiv sein und äh, es ist für einen guten Zweck und klar, es tut auch was für einen selber, aber ja, man kann auch was erreichen damit. Ja, erstens der Teamgedanke, weil halt so viele Leute mit teilnehmen und äh, ich fahre halt gerne Fahrrad und fahre in der Mittagspause immer mit dem Fahrrad äh, hin und her und äh, versuche die Kilometer zu sammeln. And all this pedaling isn't in vain. It's for great causes. With INEOS pledging 1,000 euros to a charity of each team's choice. Over at Cologne, 3,000 euros has gone to the Cull 99ers, a local wheelchair basketball team. I think the support that INEOS are giving us with this initiative is just fantastic. We're, we're always looking, we're improving the, the fan base and the, the support from outside. Can only help with building the club up and building the, the exposure, I suppose, that we want to try and create in the region, but also further afield. So the, the support that INEOS are giving us is, is just great with this initiative. The fact that they are already very engaged in the sport and also for our Projekt, was wir überlegt haben, ist natürlich so der Bezug zu den ganzen Schulen, die Kooperationen, die INEOS schon hat, äh, ein wertvoller Part, dass wir sozusagen in der äh, Recherche der Schulen schon mal vielleicht einen Schritt voraus sind sozusagen, dass man da nicht bei Null anfängt. Man kann einfach auch an den Schulen dieses Thema behinderte Menschen, Behindertensport ganz einfach anders transportieren. Das ist für die Kinder sowas wie Autoscooter fahren und äh, Spaß haben sozusagen und gleichzeitig Ängste, Heimschwellen, wie auch immer gegenüber behinderten Menschen abbauen. And if all that cycling wasn't enough, then the team at Cologne have an invitation to switch two wheels for four. I think it would be great for some of the guys from the INEOS site to come and just either watch or they can get in the chairs and they can, they can have a try and, and see how, they, uh, how the sport is played. Keep an eye out for the next INEOS Energy Station Challenge. Less than two years ago, INEOS made one of its most ambitious moves to date, acquiring a collection of wells in the North Sea. At the time, it seemed like a risky move. However, following two recent acquisitions, INEOS is now strengthening its position in the North Sea and its foothold in the energy industry. These are big deals, so we've had a closer look at this venture and its significance. 18 months ago, INEOS moved into the oil and gas sector with its purchase of DEA UK. INEOS Breyer was born. The UK for us, I think, was a natural starting place, partly because we are a British company and, and we have our heritage here. Uh, so we know the political climate well, uh, we, we know how to operate in the UK. Uh, the attraction with Breyer was that it, it brought not just the assets and the production and the, 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 the hydrocarbons, if you like, but an entire organisation that, that gave us a, a step up in capability of, of, of both running and operating what we had acquired, but also looking at further uh, acquisitions into, into the North Sea. So uh, Bray has been a fantastic journey. After completing the deal in late 2015, the oil and gas prices dropped sharply. But this now being an INEOS company, 
That was just another challenge to overcome. It made everybody focus and saying, OK, we need to make our, our own destiny here, as, as is common in, in INEOS. And, and therefore, it provided an impetus for the organisation to say, well, what are we spending money on? What are the things we really want to do? What are the things we don't actually have to do, or at least not now? That process has gone very well. The organisation has responded superbly. And we're now in a, in a, in a place where you know, we're executing uh, two new wells on, on the Brea platform. Um, and we're in the process of uh, executing a, a, a quite a big project for Clipper South to route it from its existing uh, gas reception terminal to, uh, to a new one, and that, that extends its life. It's been a tough market to crack, but some innovative deal-making has kept things buoyant, which in turn has benefited INEOS with the recent acquisition of the Forties Pipeline System. This 235-mile pipe links 85 North Sea oil and gas assets to the UK mainland and delivers almost 40% of the UK's North Sea oil and gas. It connects the North Sea to Keneal, which is a processing station right next to our site here in Grangemouth, where it gets processed and separated into the oil and the gas components and then sold on. You're working with hydrocarbons is classic in EOS. So we've got the skill set to, to deal with the molecules. Uh, it's just applying the simplicity of the Ineos model. All the gas out of, uh, or the majority of the gas out of Keneal goes is sold to Ineos anyway, so there's, there's a whole lot of synergies round about Grangemouth. But the other area is, if we can make Ineos a positive light, in the, or FPS a positive light in the North Sea, so it's, it's actually like almost like a beacon with long tentacles goes into the industry, and people start to see, well, Ineos is somebody we can do business with. In addition to both of these upstream businesses, INEOS is in the process of buying Dong Energy's oil and gas business, another massive deal that takes INEOS further into this arena. The Dong acquisition is a major step up. We're, we're adding 440 new employees with expertise in basins that we haven't operated in before. So we get West of Shetland in the, in the UK, which is a young basin. We get Denmark, where we got some great project opportunities to develop. And we get a share in one of the really major gas producers in Norway, Norman Lange, uh, and we'll grow our business around that. And, and this transaction opens up new targets both organically with projects and, and acreage and, uh, and opportunities inside the portfolio as well as adjacent acquisition opportunities. So, you know, watch this space. We'll, uh, we'll continue to, uh, to, to look at growing further as well. It's looking very good. I mean, the site's investing. We've got our cracker now up to full rate. Now with the, with the FPS business, it's, it's looking up. There's more investment coming. You know, we're, as an organisation, we're very <coughs> focused on growth. We can see lots of opportunities in this portfolio. We've, got, we've obviously got things to learn, um, uh, but I think uh, you know, it's, it offers some exciting opportunities. Normally for InTV, I get to put your questions to our chairman. However, this month, Jim was invited to the Sunday Times Profit Track 100 Awards, where my job was taken over by Ian Day, the Sunday Times business editor. Thanks for coming to join me on the stage here, Jim. Um, obviously, I think um, among business readers and my readers, you've become a bit of a household name over the past few years. How did you, how did you get started? So, I mean, you and your team, you really risked everything. You put everything on the line. And you know, I was very conventional in my sort of early years. I went to university, did chemical engineering, and then I spent 15 years in industry, followed by, which was a very interesting period for me, I spent five years in venture capital from about the age of 35 to 40. Um, and you, you sort of look that you, that you learn a lot of new disciplines in venture capital, but it's all about doing deals and buying businesses and investing and divesting and all that sort of stuff. Um, and at the age of 40, I kicked off on, on my own uh, through one of the deals that I did in my venture capital work. So you uh, crossed the fence. So I crossed the fence, which is quite unusual actually. Uh, uh, but when I did start at the age of 40 and uh, I did hop over the fence, one of the, one of the philosophies of venture capital in those days was they wanted everything you owned on the line, including your sort of children and cat and your dog, really. So they, they really wanted your, you know, whole attention if, you're going, if, you, if you were going to be spending their money. Uh, so, and that is where I finished up at the age of 40. I, everything was mortgage, everything was mortgage, the children, the cat, the dog, the house, the car, everything. They had what everything that, on them. What was that first unloved business that you had to pin your hopes on? Well, that was the one down in the New Forest in Southampton, which was, it was BP Fine Chemicals down on near Forley Refinery. That business we ran as a public company for six years till 98. 
and then we, we uh, then I flipped into Ineos in 98. The last time that, that we sat down together was um, in Switzerland, because you yes. moved the company to Switzerland <clears throat> um, in the financial crisis, and that was to talk about how you'd stare bankruptcy in the face and come back again. I mean, that, you had some pretty tough times in the financial crisis, didn't you? Yeah, we had a tough time in 2000, 2000 well, I mean, a lot of people had a tough time in 2008, 2009, but what, if, what effectively happened here was for, for us was that the business itself didn't do too badly, but what happened in Ineos was, the price of oil, I don't know whether you, people here will recall, but the price of oil in the summer of 2008 was $140 at its peak, and at Christmas it was $39. Yeah. So it collapsed by $100 in six months, and we have a lot of oil set in refineries. The value of that oil yeah. reduced by a billion dollars. But what it did do was it breached a covenant that nobody had ever contemplated. The banks took 846 million million euros out of the company in the next in 12 fees months. and penalty fees interest and penalties, and... Yeah. yeah so that right. was what caused the problem in any of and yet so you my, saw the, my you advice saw the to light. you would be don't breach covenant <laughs> if i have any advice here that's the single piece of advice i would don't ever breach covenant yeah. but and now also you've got this great project project grenadier to yes. recreate some kind of successor to the the land rover defender yeah so we sort of think there's a I mean, it's manufacturing. It's not the type of manufacturing we've, you know, we're sort of mainstream for us, really. But I mean, there, there clearly is a, you know, a hole <coughs> for that. It's been around for 67 years, and people have pet names for Defenders. They don't have pet names yeah. for any other car, do they? Because it, you know, I don't know of any Defender I've ever come across that didn't have a name. Some, somebody has a name for it, you know. And I think it's a, it's a, you know, it's a tragic loss to humanity. That you know, the Defender was stopped two or three years ago. So, and is it going to be built in Britain? We'd like it to be built in Britain, but the numbers have to add up. I can't sort of. Have you I got a sort plan of in mind? Would you build, build a completely greenfield plant, or would you take capacity? Well, the, <clears throat> the issue is if you is if you if you build it in the UK, you have to build a greenfield plant because there aren't any, there aren't any right. alternatives in the UK. If we build it in Europe, there are lots of plants that we can acquire, which people have vacated. I'd very much like to build it in the UK if we can. Now we return to a story that's been running for several months. A year ago, on this very show, INEOS announced a new challenge to members of its graduate scheme, INNAM 17, five days of running and cycling through the Namibian desert. For 12 months, INTV has been following the determined grads as they got fitter and fitter. Then in June, they finally landed in Namibia. So we are just on our way for our first morning run. For nine months, a group of INEOS graduates have been preparing for a unique 350 mile endurance challenge across Namibia. I'm looking forward uh, to meeting all the guys a bit further, and especially the Americans because we haven't seen them yet, and then uh, see how far we can push our, ourselves. We have literally come, done an 11 hour flight. We have then gone on to a really tiny mini propeller plane, which was terrifying for about an hour and a half, got to the middle of nowhere and then driven for another hour to get where we are now. Finally, the date arrived and the Namibian wilderness awaited. Were they ready? Anybody nervous? <laughs> On the first day, the team cruised through the sand and rock. But after a night under the stars, the following morning, the desert bit back. generally have the wind from our backs, which is the cold wind from the sea. And uh, unfortunately, the norm of desert changed its tune and said, sorry, you're going to have the hot wind from the, from the inland. So uh, it's made cycling incredibly tough. And uh, I'm afraid we're going to have to bunch together in pelotons to uh, try and get through this. I've never hated anything in the world more than this wind just now. This wind is terrific. The wind just saps any energy out of you. The sand saps the rest. And you're just dehydrated because any sweat straight off you. The, the, the interesting stat is that they ran the first 21 faster than they cycled the next 21. That's how slow the going's been. Despite the adverse conditions, everyone made it to the camp before nightfall. <laughs> oh, yes. It was getting darker and darker, and more people were dropping off. Um, even one of the, the guides was being sick at one point, um, but we made it. There were plenty of tired bodies, 
But respite was short-lived, as sunrise brought with it a new mountain to climb, literally. So we came here to attempt the Brandberg mountain, one of the uh, highlights of what uh, Namibia is about. Uh, everybody was a little, uh, uh, how can you call it, nervous. There was a bit of intrepidation, but they seemed to uh, take on the challenge. We're a bit lost. We came a bit of the wrong way, so now we're going back down. And um, coming up was hard enough. I really want to make it to the summit. I'll be gutted if we don't, but we'll wait and see, because this isn't easy. The punishing climb split the group, and reaching the summit became a race against time. Mini meltdown over. I'm gonna smash it now. One hundred and sixty kilometers down, with one hundred and eighty still to go, the grads had to dig deep and face up to the desert marathon. That was the fourth day's test. Along the route, a surprise lay in store to give them a boost for the final push. Ineos chairman Jim Ratcliffe had flown in to run the final leg of the challenge alongside his graduates. It was clearly a real test of character and a real adventure. Something very, very different than Ineos, you know, in its own way, is sort of different. And we need people in an organisation like Ineos which have got a bit of grit and determination, a bit of character. After five days and 350 desert kilometres, every single graduate crossed the finish line, completing what must be one of the most epic corporate graduate events ever. But they'll never forget the times together. And they're pretty real times. I mean, there's tears and there's blood and there's 12-hour there's days of digging deep. And you, you, you feed off each other. And that becomes, I think, unbreakable. Yeah. I'm pretty sure that as time goes by, this group of, of graduates will really have a special bond because of this week. Wow, what an incredible trip and experience. I hope they've all recovered. Now, you and he, they're recruiting for next year. Are you in? That's the spirit. Well, I'm afraid that's all we've got time for in this edition. So until next time, goodbye and thanks for watching. Thank you.